A few months ago, when I just started coming up with this TEDx talk, uh, I had planned to kind of go into some fun little philosophical topics and concepts with you. But what I had not planned for at the time was that I would lose my voice the day before the presentation. So if I sound a little rushed, it's because I'm in a lot of pain with talking. So right off the bat, in order for us to get to the conclusion that I want to make, um, in the time that I want to get there, I need you all to forget everything that your senses have ever taught you about reality. Cool? All right, <laughs> moving on. Uh, the reason that I want you to do that is because I believe that our perception of reality is flawed at the fundamental level, which is why I called my talk Fundamentals, the only reason. Um, see, we go through our day-to-day -day life believing that the world around us is made up of separate objects, stage, chairs, papers, and this is not the case. See, in reality, we evolved in such a way that our senses pick up and discern separate parts of our environment so that we could pick up distinct groups of what might be a danger to us or what we might be able to eat. And in order for me to continue and for you to feel comfortable kind of putting this into your brain, I need to make something clear, which is that there are no lions in the room, so you're good. And if you're hungry, like me, uh, you'll be able to get food later, so you don't need to be looking out for that. See, a thing, what we call a thing, is really a unit of reality. It is a single idea attached to a certain group of molecules. And but in actuality, there is never actually any objective separation between one thing and another thing. It's all one big group of molecules and energy and matter exchanging and moving around. See, and that's a thing that if you think about for a while, it becomes part of your common sense, but I know that some of you might have just been introduced to that a few seconds ago, so don't worry, I'll go into that a bit more. Right now, I want to go into another concept that reality and the universe as it exists outside of our brain is completely unimaginable. Because that goes back to the question, the first question that really made you think about the true nature of reality. When a tree falls in a forest and there is no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? See, the answer to this question is no. Because when a tree falls, it creates vibrations in the air molecules, which travel outwards. And if there is someone there to pick up those molecules, it hits their eardrum, which sends a signal back to their brain, and then creates the sensation of sound. What? <laughs> the movement of air particles creates the sensation of sound, a completely unique phenomenon. The brain completely made up its own way to, to interpret movement and made it into sound. And this logic and train of thought can get a little bit out of hand when you go into things like light. Because light is a particle called a photon. And a photon in itself doesn't really look like anything until it hits the iris, bounces off, or it doesn't bounce off, it bounces off of an object, goes into the pupil, and then sends a signal back to the brain creates the cessation of looking like anything, which means that in between you and me right now, the universe smells, feels, looks, sounds, and tastes like nothing. And if you'd like to get a kind of idea of what looking like nothing is, it's not darkness, because darkness is the human interpretation of the absence of light. Try to look at the back of your head. Right now, close your eyes and try to see what it looks like through the back of your head. Notice that there is darkness in front of you, but there is just purely nothing behind you. So we find that reality is this kind of big ball of indescribable, wibbly, wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. It's jiggly, it's just exchanging matter and energy. Because if we look at a single system of things, say a plant, we call it a plant, say it, that it is a distinct organism, a distinct part of its environment. But if we look at all the systems, if we look at the energy and the matter that it uses to make itself, has already been cycling throughout the environment before it, 
and it will continue after it. And so it's not really even a thing. It is the unit that we assigned to this certain group of molecules that is jiggling around a little bit slower. And so we can look at things the same way that we do look at waves. Because when we look at a wave, it's not actually a single thing. See, a wave is just this body of water that we call a wave. We have a noun for it. Even though it's less of a noun and more of a process of water rising up, moving along. From one second to another, it's never the same thing. And it's not even separate from the rest of the ocean, like every other object that we assign a name to. Now this idea includes you, because you, it's a pretty well-known fact that you know, every seven years, every cell in your body is replaced by things that you've eaten, or the oxygen that you've breathed. Um, and this include, and so when we try to draw the separation between what we are and what we are not, if we look at a sandwich on a plate, when you eat the sandwich, first you don't identify it as you. But when it, once it enters you, nothing inherently about the sandwich changes. Maybe, well, the texture and the, uh, the grouping that makes it does. But what does change is our perception of it. Nothing else does. It's no laws are broken, no rips in the fabric of space-time are made. It's just the perception. The unit that we assign to it changes, and then the sandwich becomes us. <coughs> but see, this isn't what we experience. What we experience are very separate, sensation-filled consciousnesses. Our consciousnesses don't uh, like ripple into each other's. I'm not experiencing what you're experiencing, and you're all having completely different experiences from each other. I mean, you're all facing this way, but so. <laughs> and I'm going for the rest of my talk. I'm going to be saying that a consciousness is made of sensations, and I'm using the word sensations pretty broadly here. I'm using sensations as in anything that is perceived, anything that you feel, including the thoughts that you listen to in your head when you picture something or imagine it, the vague image that appears, anything that you perceive, I'm calling a sensation because it is a completely unique phenomenon. And recently, neurologists have made a lot of progress in figuring out which neurons in their brain are responsible for which images, which ideas, uh, when we remember or picture something, and uh, especially in technologies like machine learning based analysis of human functional magnetic resonance imaging patterns, or fMRI for short, however you get fMRI from that, it uses AI that recognizes the patterns, certain patterns and charges in the neurons in your head, and can then project a recognized image onto a screen. It's not great, but it's really cool. This is literally mind-reading technology. But this is still not a sensation. This is still a physical reaction happening in the world. And so neurologists have, from Georgia Tech, UCLA, have started coming to the consensus that the brain in itself cannot create sensations without there being a previous property of the universe which does allow consciousness and the sensations that make it to exist. And so with this in mind, with the, with the idea that this property that is using you to express itself, that the molecules in your brain and body have already been circling around the universe before you and will continue on after you, the next statement sounds kind of mean at first, but it gets much better. You created nothing new when you, created, when you came into this world. No new forces or laws of nature were made. And yet it feels like there was a beginning to you. It feels like there was a part that separates what you remember from what you don't. And the crazy thing about sensations, the crazy thing about that consciousness that feels like it is a separate thing is that it's felt. Sensations are the one thing 
that are felt. And so we have to ask the question, felt by what? What is feeling all of the reactions going on in your head? See, it's the universe that possesses the molecules in your brain and body that make you. And it is the universe that possesses the properties that allow you to have consciousness. And so when we ask the question, what is aware that you are thinking right now? The answer is that you are not a single person experiencing the universe. You are instead the universe experiencing the phenomenon of a single person at a single time. But you know, we kind of want to feel that. You know, if, if we were everything, then we would want to be omniscient, omnipotent, you know, all-knowing or all-powerful. If we really were everything, we would want to become or be a God. But we don't feel like that. So let me fix that for you. See, <laughs> right now, you identify this as you. But even though you identify this as you, you're not inherently aware of the millions of incredibly important interactions going on in it. And you're also not consciously in control of it. In the same way that you're not consciously aware of your breathing. But in spite of that, since the beginning of my talk, you've been breathing. I hope. <laughs> but you haven't been thinking about it. But as soon as you do become consciously aware that you are breathing, you can then take a deep breath or blow all of your air out, and you come, can become, to a certain extent, consciously aware of it, and you can control it. And so, we see, and so we see that the lines between what we are in control of and what we are not in control of are blurred, even though we are not consciously aware of it. Because you are circulating the blood in your veins, you are firing off the charges in your head, even though you are not consciously aware of it. You are doing it using the same laws that exist outside of your body that are letting you live inside your body. And so there is no separation between what we are and are not in control of. And I'm not saying that means that we're not in control of anything, and I'm also not saying that means that we are in control of everything. I'm saying that there is no difference between the two that your will is not separate from the natural processes of the universe. All right, my thought experiment is this. Imagine just for one second that you are everything. That you are that. That's, in, that's your yearbook picture. Just everything that exists, everything that will exist, everything that ever has existed, identifies as you. But really the only way that a you like that could experience anything was through some biological sensory systems, through a brain that allowed all these processes to happen and a body that had to be kept alive. And of course, this happened multiple times because the properties that allow you to exist exist throughout the entire universe. And so there happened to be a planet where it happened multiple times. And so, the, and so you ex began experiencing yourself from multiple perspectives. But if that were the case, if that was what was happening, then wouldn't our experience be just a pinpoint inside this vast ocean of nothing, the complete experience of nothing throughout the rest of the universe? But what we forget is that the lack of an experience cannot be an experience. It can only be experienced in contrast to something that is being experienced like trying to look out the back of your head. If you try to find the part that separates what you see from what you do not see, there is no direct line there. There is no definite separation. And so we find that there is no separation between what we experience and what we do not experience. And, and so the universe has two sides. It has the conscious experience made purely of sensations, of free will, made purely of all of these things that make our experience so amazing. And then the other side, which is made of whatever the universe is like in its unobserved state. It's nothing that we can describe or come close to imagining. It's, and so we find that, the, that we bring 
beauty and meaning and purpose to the universe. We bring this entire auditorium into existence through our senses, not consciously aware of it, but we are doing it. And so we find that the universe is in us, and we are in it, and of course it is in us, and we are in it, and it's two sides of the same coin. Each side needs the other to be anything at all. Like the nothingness in your experience can only exist in comparison to the something that is in front of you. But we put ourselves down. And we think about things like how insignificant we are compared to the vastness of outer space. And we think about how we're just this tiny chemical reaction happening on this rock that doesn't really mean anything. Or we believe that we have our own soul that secludes us from the rest of existence. Or we believe that we are just off in this corner of the universe that will never really have any impact on anything further out than our backyard. And those thoughts and statements can hurt. And they can bring you down, especially when you're a self-doubting teen who just wants to try to find more meaning in life than getting good grades so that we can get into a good college so that I can find a job that I love so that I can uh, wor love working and then retire and die in peace. That's our goal in life. The end goal is the goal. We don't realize that this moment, this sensation-filled moment, is the purpose. Two sides of the universe. This is the point, this exact moment. I'd, I know you would love to leave, but this moment is the point. And so, you aren't God, really, in the Western sense of the word. You know, there is no separation. It's a bit more humble than that. There's no separation between what you are and what you are not. No separation between what you experience and what you do not experience. And no separation between what you are in control of and what you are not in control of. And so... Now that I have kind of the basics down, I think I could start my presentation. Um, so, <laughs> my presentation starts when you go outside and you listen, as Alan Watts put it, to the jazz of everything. The people jazz, the car jazz, the bird jazz, the ants jazz and look at all of it kind of mixed together and form the life jazz. And then it mixes out into the rest of the universe and becomes the everything jazz. And realize that there is no difference between your jazz and that jazz. Because you are not a single person experiencing the universe. As I said, you are the universe experiencing the phenomenon of a single person. Thank you.